Good morning and thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Superintendent Steve Watts of Organized Crime Enforcement to share the results of Project Barbell, a firearm trafficking investigation that has resulted in multiple arrests and as you can see, the seizure of dozens of illegal firearms. In front of you today are 62 firearms, including five AR-15 semi-automatic automatic rifles. 260 charges have been laid against six individuals, one of whom has now been identified as a suspect in a reckless shooting that occurred in a crowded bar in October of 2021. While we are here to show the public the results of a successful investigation, this is not a good news story. While it represents outstanding police work, we should all be disturbed by a gun seizure of this magnitude. Gun violence continues to be the most significant public safety concern for the people of Toronto. Why? Because our youth are dying over this issue. Shootings devastate families and erode the sense of security for entire communities. And every one of these guns was destined for our streets and our communities. StatsCan recently reported that the national homicide rate increased by a third straight year. Noteworthy is that nearly a quarter of the killings in 2021 were linked to gangs and organized crime. Community safety is a shared responsibility and the root causes of gun and gang violence are complex and extend far beyond the scope of policing. We remain fully committed to working with our partner agencies and all levels of government on prevention and addressing root causes for those who are at risk. But let me be clear, we are equally committed to targeting those who are high risk, those who choose to carry and to use illegal guns in our neighborhoods. In addition to our commitments to prevention and enforcement, we have also advocated through our board for bail reform and other legislative changes to better tackle gun violence in our city. These include ensuring that bail hearings for the most serious firearm offenses are heard by a judge of the Ontario court or superior court to hold the most high risk offenders more accountable for their dangerous actions. Amending the criminal code so that someone who intentionally uses a gun in a public setting surrounded by innocent people like a park or a nightclub is prosecuted to the full extent of the law, including a charge of first degree murder if someone is killed in these circumstances. In other words, firing a handgun in a congregate setting, or at least alternatively, consider increasing bail opportunities to be somehow mirror first degree murder. And finally, a commitment to ongoing funding at our border crossings. We've indeed received millions of dollars in federal funding that's allowing C CBSA to have more boots on the ground and to help all, lever all levels of firearm uh, investigation, a lot of uh, firearm investigation to continue to deal with smuggling and trafficking, which is the essence of where all these firearms has come have come from. But there's more investment that needs to be made. So again, I wanna thank our officers, particularly those in our uh, integrated gang and gun task force for their hard work and dedication to community safety. As you can see by what's on display here, this is a tremendous achievement. And now I'm gonna ask Steve Watts of Organized Crime Enforcement to provide more details about this investigation. Steve. Thank you, Chief, for your opening comments. Um, good morning, all of you. Thank, thank you for attending today. First of all, I'd like to personally commend and thank all of our members, investigators, supervisory personnel, and the support staff who contributed to this project file on behalf of myself, the command and the chief, and more importantly, the overall community that we serve. I am extremely confident and can state without reservation that this particular investigation has absolutely increased the level of public safety. And that includes not only this year, but moving forward into 2023. In relation to this investigation, commencing in the fall of 2021, members of the Integrated Gun and Gang Task Force launched an investigation into an organized criminal group involved in firearm trafficking operating out of the Toronto area. At the onset, 
<clears throat> police identified two persons of interest. It's Mr. Syed Mohammed Ali Zaidi, 27 years of Scarborough, and Mr. Michael Livingston, Livingston Simpson, 29 years, also of Scarborough. Investigators believed that each party to have a primary and defined role within this network. Through further investigation, it was determined that criminality was occurring and this project was dubbed Project Barbell. Investigators at the Gun and Gang Task Force conducted an extremely extensive and detailed investigation and followed the evidence in this case. This led to the further identification of vehicles and addresses used by Mr. Zaidi and Mr. Simpson. During May of 2022, determination was that sufficient evidence had been gathered on the involved persons and alleged, and alleged conduct and addresses and vehicles of interest that identified. On May 28th of 2022, criminal code search warrants were executed at the addresses and vehicles associated with the named parties. <clears throat> so for arrest and search warrant results, both Mr. Zaidi and his girlfriend, surname of Tirmizi, T-I-R-M-I-Z-I, -I, they were arrested that day in a building in the area of Victoria Park in Huntingwood Drive area. At the time of his arrest, Mr. Zaidi was in personal possession of two firearms. The second party, Mr. Simpson, was located and arrested at a restaurant in the area of Kennedy Road and Ellesmere Road. He was also found to be in possession of one of the firearms in front of you at the time of his arrest. Further arrested parties were arrested subsequent to the search warrants. <clears throat> there was a criminal code search warrant was executed at a building in the area of Ellesmere and Markham Road where investigators located the majority of these firearms. Two other individuals within the unit were arrested as well. Specifically, investigators located three AK type rifles, one of which was loaded with 61 rounds of 7.62 ammunition, five AR-15 type carbine style rifles, 51 semi-automatic handguns, 31 firearm magazines, and a total of 132 rounds of assorted caliber ammunition. There was additional search warrants, three additional search warrants were executed where there was <clears throat> proceeds of crimes seized. At another search warrant at Kingston Road and St. Clair Avenue East, there were an additional eight firearms magazines seized and 118 rounds of assorted ammunition. And at the fourth search warrant, there was an additional quantity of firearm magazines seized as well as a bulletproof vest. There was also two vehicles seized in this investigation, a BMW X6, and a BMW 4 Series. These were later identified as re-VIN vehicles, stolen fraudulently, registered with the MTO under false VIN numbers. I'd like to refer to an occurrence that happened back on October 19, 2021. Mr. Zaidi had been identified as a person of interest in a shooting incident at Bar Karma, which is located at 512 Queen Street East and 14 Division. This incident happened in a crowded bar after an altercation between two opposing groups. Evidence at the time was circumstantial. Consequently, Mr. Zaidi was not charged at that time. After Mr. Zaidi was arrested in relation to this project, our centralized shooting response team investigators were able to confirm him as their shooting suspect, specifically by specific, specific to tattoos and physical descriptors. So Mr. Zaidi has been charged with additional offenses related to that firearms occurrence and that incident. So he faces a separate set of charges in relation to that incident. In summary, <clears throat> Project Barbell spanned eight months from start to finish, focused on an armed criminal network. And as I said, through investigative efforts, identified the addresses and vehicles associated. These search warrants led to the total of 62 firearms eight rifles, as I said, a quantity of various calibers of ammunition, two vehicles. A total of six parties were arrested with a combined total of 260 criminal charges. A total of four individuals have been put before the courts. You have that in your press release, which is one out. That includes Mr. Zaidi, 
Mr. Simpson, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into all the charges for obvious reasons. And all four individuals will be appearing at Toronto East Courts on December 9th, uh, room 407, 9 a.m. Um, the one other thing I'll comment on about this display of firearms in front of you is of the 62 firearms seized, 58 were traced, four were untraceable, four of the AR-15 types were untraceable, no serial numbers, no make and model. Of the remaining 58 that were traced, 57 were traced to the United States, to US, primarily Arizona and Texas, and only one of these firearms was traced to Ontario. It was a stolen firearm from a break and enter back in 2021. So in essence, the overwhelming, you know, whatever that is, 98% of these firearms were traced from the US. So that speaks to the chief's comment about our border integrity and the flow of illegal crime guns coming up from the United States. That concludes my comments, subject to your questions for the chief and I. So did I hear you correctly that only one of these guns that's being presented was a legal handgun? Did I, did I hear that part correctly? Correct. Correct. So, and the majority of these came from the United States. And did you seize any hunting rifles as a result? Were there long guns like hunting rifles seized as part of your investigation? No. Everything, the completeness, the total, total seizures are in front of you here today. Where are all these guns going? I'm suggesting they're destined for Toronto and the GTA. Um, the individuals that were arrested were alleging had firearms, had three of these firearms on their person, and this was a supply to be sold, to be sold on the streets of Toronto and in the GTA. Do you know how they were coming up from the States? Not going to uh, speak to that. Can you just talk about sort of how that relates to the bigger problem of gun violence on our streets? I know that the mayor is quite vocal about it, and the chief is vocal about it. Uh, if all these are coming from the states, what does that say about the bigger problem and what are sort of the resolutions to address it? Well, that's a multi-layered, that's a multi-layered question and probably a long conversation that we don't have time for today. I mean, obviously, um, obviously it's access to firearms. Everyone's familiar with, you know, we've talked about it before. It, it has to do with immediate access to firearms. We talk about historically, perhaps, if you and I were involved in a road rage incident, um, I may have my firearm back at my apartment being held by a friend, a partner. Now, with the proliferation of the handguns we see in the streets specifically, the immediate access means I have that firearm on my person. So that means our verbal argument escalates to maybe physical gestures, go to a verbal argument, go to the windows, roll down, and we're in the drive-thru at the McDonald's or the Tim Hortons, well, I no longer have to call my friend to go get my gun or call my, to bring my gun or go to another location. I have immediate access. And so that's what this volume of firearms shows. That's what we're alleging Mr. Zaidi had when he had two firearms on his person upon his arrest prior to doing the search warrant. So that's what it comes down to, immediate access and availability of firearms on the person, I mean, on your immediate person. How much are they selling for? These are all high quality firearms. You'll be able to come up, take a look. They're all predominantly Glocks. The majority of them are Glocks. Um, they'll go for anywhere between forty-five and six thousand dollars a piece. Forty-five hundred to six thousand dollars a piece on the streets. Correct. Well, that's subject to negotiation, so we could negotiate that. The, uh, the larger guns, the AKs and the ARs. What do they sell for? Um, I believe there, that would be probably dependent on, dependent on if you're getting ammunition with them and stuff like that. So that would be flexible as well. But they would be, they would be multiple thousand dollars to purchase those as well. Is these same people selling the bullets or are these different markets selling the bullets to the people with the guns? Mm, I would say it's, well, they were selling them with, it, when you go to purchase, you would pay a different amount if you're buying it with rounds or with ra without rounds. There was a time when we saw when we saw a lack or we saw a 
there was a shortage of ammunition. We're not seeing that any longer. We're seeing that you all report on it. We're seeing the amount of rounds that are being discharged during our firearm incidents. You know, it's routinely 20, 30, 40 rounds at a time as opposed to four or five. So I'm gonna comment, you know, a few years ago, rounds were limited, but now we're seeing a high, high proliferation of the rounds discharged. The same charges will, will be applied with the person selling the ammunition or is it different charges? Well, the, the primary function is you're selling the firearm, so it's the sale of the firearm, so that, that would be a mitigating factor. One more question. 4,500 to 6,000 is a lot for mm -hmm. a gun. What does that say about sort of what the return on investment would be for somebody who's willing to shell out that kind of money for a gun? Well, it's a very good return on investment if, you know, depending, depending on how much you're paying. If you're paying, if you're paying under $1,000, which you would be paying in the U.S. for a Glock handgun, regardless of the model, and you can turn that into a $6,000 a $6, profit, then you're looking at, you know, essentially $5,000 profit per item. So it's, it's about profit, too. Chief, you, you mentioned bail uh, conditions during your remarks there. Uh, the Premier talked about bail just the other day. The Mayor constantly talks about toughening up bail conditions. If sort of all the parties are calling for it, what do you think the reason is that we haven't seen that happen yet? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I think the issue for, from our perspective is that we'd like to see judges doing the bail hearings. Judges also conduct the prelims, although we don't have as many of those now, but, and the trials. And I think they have, a, they have better legal training, of course, and they have a better understanding of the trauma and the impact that, that uh, these occurrences are having on, on victims and families. And so uh, from our perspective, we think it would, they are much better suited to do it. I think as well, when we're talking about the, the more serious gun charges, we're talking about the high-risk people. And there's got to be a level of accountability. There's got to, there needs to be an understanding that if you're going to engage in this for a profit motive, there's substantial liability engaging in this. Because again, the impact and the trauma is, is pretty significant and we're seeing it. And one of the things that concerns us more than anything else is the number of innocent victims that are being caught in the crossfire. When you're downtown at some of these clubs and shots are being fired and, and some un unsuccess unsuspecting person is catching around and these individuals needed to be treated to be need to be treated severely or who are involved in this kind of activity sorry I was, rem I was remiss in not um, thanking our partnership our partnership with uh, ATF from the US they were uh, um, and continue to be strong collaborators with us in these type of investigations so I'd like to put on rec to thank them as well Sure. I'm not going to get into the comments of that at this point in time. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That was the last question. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.